Chapter 25 of The Wild Northland by William Francis Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25. On the evening of my arrival at Germanson, Mr. Rufus Sylvester appeared from the south, carrying the mail for the camp. Eleven days earlier, he had started from Quinell on the Fraser River. The trail was, he said, in a very bad state. Snow yet lay five feet deep on the Bald and Nation River mountains. The rivers and streams were running bank high. He had swum his horses eleven times, and finally left them on the south side of the Bald Mountains, coming on on foot to his destination. The distance to Quinell was about 330 miles. Such was the summary of his report. The prospect was not encouraging, but where movement is desired, if people wait until prospects become encouraging, they will be likely to rest stationary a long time. My plan of movement to the south was this. I would dispense with everything save those articles absolutely necessary to travel. Food and clothing would be brought to the lowest limits, and then, with our goods on our shoulders, and with Surf Vola carrying on his back a load of dry meat sufficient to fill his stomach during ten days, we would set out on foot to cross the Bald Mountains. Thirty miles from the mining camp, at the south side of the mountain range, Rufus Sylvester had left a horse and a mule. We would recover them again, and, packing our goods upon them, make our way to Fort St. James on the wild shores of Stewart's Lake, midway on our journey to where, on the bend of the Fraser River, the first vestige of civilization would greet us at the city called Quinell. It was the 25th of May when, having loaded my goods upon the back of a Haida Indian from the coast, and giving Calder a lighter load to carry, I set off with Surf Bola for the south. Idleness during the past three weeks had produced a considerable change in the person of the untiring. He had grown fat and round, and it was no easy matter to strap his bag of dry meat upon his back so as to prevent it from performing the feat known, in the case of a saddle on a horse's back, by the term turning. It appeared to be a matter of perfect indifference to the untiring whether the meat destined for his stomach was carried beneath that portion of his body or above his back. He pursued the even tenor of his way in either case, but a disposition on his part to squat in every pool of water or patch of mud along the trail, perfectly regardless of the position of his ten days' ration, had the effect of quickly changing its nature when it was underneath him from dry meat to very wet meat, and making the bag which held it a kind of water cart for the drier portions of the trail. Twelve miles from Germanson Creek stood the other mining camp of Manson. More ditches, more drains, more miners, more drinking, two or three larger saloons, more sixes and sevens of diamonds and debilitated-looking kings and queens of spades littering the dusty street the wrecks of faro and poker and seven-up and three-card monte, more Chinamen and Haida squaws than Germans had could boast of. In Manson lay the same miserable-looking place that its older rival had already appeared to me. Yet every person was kind and obliging. Mr. Graham, postmaster, dealer in gold dust, and general merchant, cooked with his own hands a most excellent repast, the discussion of which was followed by further introductions to mining celebrities. Prominent among the many Joes and Davises and Peets and Bills, I recollect one well-known name. It was the name of Smith. We have all known, I presume, some person of that name. We have also known innumerable prefixes to it, such as Sydney, Washington, Buckingham, etc., etc., but here at Manson dwelt a completely new Smith. No hero of ancient or modern times had been called on to supply a prefix or a second name, but in the person of Mr. Peace River Smith, I recognized a new title for the old and familiar family. Mr. Sterling's saloon at Manson was a very fair representation of what, in this country, we would call a public house. But in some respects, the saloon and the public differ widely. The American saloon is eminently patriotic. 
Western America, indeed America generally, takes its cocktails in the presence of soul-stirring mementos. From above the lemons, the colored wine glass, the bunch of mint, and the many alcoholic mixtures which stand behind the bar, General Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and President Grant look placidly upon the tippling miner. But though Mr. Sterling's saloon could boast its card tables, its patriotic pictures, and its many slings and juleps, in one important respect it fell far short of the ideal mining paradise. It was not a hurdy house. Music and dancing were both wanting. It was a serious drawback, but it was explained to me that Manson had become too much played out to afford to pay the piper, and Hurdy's had never penetrated to the fastnesses of the Peace River mines. When the last mining hero had departed, I lay down in Mr. Graham's sanctum to snatch a few hours' sleep ere the first dawn would call us to the march. I lay on the postmaster's bed, while that functionary got together his little bags of gold dust, his few letters and mail matters for my companion, Rufus Sylvester the express man. This work occupied him until shortly before dawn, when he abandoned it to again resume the duties of cook in preparing my breakfast. Day was just breaking over the pine-clad hills as we bade adieu to this kind host, and with rapid strides set out through the sleeping camp. Calder, the Haida Indian, and the untiring had preceded us on the previous evening, and I was alone with the express man, Mr. Rufus Sylvester. He carried on his back a small, compact, but heavy load, some six hundred ounces of gold dust being the weightiest item. But nevertheless, he crossed with rapid steps over the frozen ground. We carried in our hands snowshoes for the mountain range still lying some eight miles away. The trail led o'er hill and through valley, gradually ascending for the first six miles, until through breaks in the pines I could discern the snowy ridges toward which we were tending. Soon the white patches lay around us in the forest, but the frost was severe and the surface was hard under our moccasins. Finding the snow crust was sufficient to bear our weight, we cached the snowshoes and held our course up the mountain. Deeper grew the snow, Thinner and smaller became the pines, dwarf things that hung wisps of blue-gray moss from their shrunken limbs. At last, they ceased to be around us, and the summit ridges of the bald mountain spread out under the low-hung clouds. The big white ptarmigan bleated like sheep in the thin, frosty air. We crossed the topmost ridge, where snow ever dwells, and saw beneath a far-reaching valley. I turned to take a last look to the north. The clouds had lifted, the sun had risen some time. Away over an ocean of peaks lay the lofty ridge I had named Galti Moor a fortnight earlier, when emerging from the Black Canyon. He rose above us, then the monarch of the range, now he lay far behind, one of the last landmarks of the wild Northland. We began to descend. Again the sparse trees were around us, the snow gradually lessened, and after five hours of incessant and rapid walking, we reached a patch of dry grass where Calder, the English miner, and the Indians with the horses were awaiting us. End of chapter 25。e of the Wild Northland by William Francis Butler。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26. We have been a long time now in that portion of the American continent which is known as British Columbia, and yet we have said but little of its early life or how it came into the limits of a defined colony. Sometime about that evening when we lay camped, now a long way back, upon the hill where the grim face of the Chimaru looked blankly out upon the darkening wilderness, we entered for the first time the territory which bears the name of British Columbia. Nature, who, whether she forms a flower or a nation, never makes a mistake, had drawn on the northern continent of America her own boundaries. She had put the Rocky Mountains to mark the two great divisions of East and West America. But the theory of natural boundaries appears never to have elicited from us much support, 
and in the instance now under consideration we seem to have gone not a little out of our way to evince our disapprobation of nature's doings it was the business of the imperial government a few years ago to define the boundaries of the new province to which they were giving a constitution the old northwest fur company had rested satisfied with the rocky mountain frontier but in the new document the eastern line was defined as follows and to the east from the boundary of the united states northwards to the rocky mountains and the one hundred and twentieth meridian of west longitude unfortunately although the one hundred and twentieth meridian is situated for a portion of its course in the main range of the mountains it does not lie altogether within them the rocky mountains do not run north and south but trend considerably to the west and the one hundred twentieth meridian passes out into the prairie country of the peace river in looking at this strangely unmeaning frontier where nature had already given such an excellent divide and one which has always been adopted by the early geographer it seems only rational to suppose that the framers of the new line lay under the impression that mountain and meridian were in one and the same line nor supposing such to be the case would it be by any means the first time that such an error had been made by those whose work it was to frame our colonial destiny well let us disregard this rectification of boundary and look at british columbia as nature had made it when some seventy years ago the fur company determined to push their trade into the most remote recesses of the unknown territory lying before them a few adventurers following the same course which i had lately taken found themselves suddenly in a labyrinth of mountains these men named the mountain land new caledonia for they had been nurtured in far highland homes and the grim pine-clad steeps of this wild region and the blue lakes lying lapped amid the mountains recalled the locks and bends of boyhood's hours twas long before they could make much of this new dominion mountains rose on every side white giants bald with age wrapped in cloud and cloaked with pines cragged and scarped and towering above valleys filled with boulders as though in bygone ages when the old peaks had been youngsters they had pelted each other with titanic stones which falling short had filled the deep ravines that lay between them but if the mountains in their vast irregularity defied the early explorers the rivers were even still more perplexing mountains have a right to behave in an irregular kind of way but rivers are usually supposed to conduct themselves on more peaceful principles in new caledonia they had apparently forgotten this rule they played all manner of tricks they turned and twisted behind the backs of hills and came out just the very way they shouldn't have come out they rose often close to the sea and then ran directly away from it they pierced through mountain ranges and canyons and chasms and the mountains threw down stones at them but that only made them laugh all the louder as they raced away from canyon to canyon sometimes they grew wicked and turned viciously and bit and worried the bases of hills and ate trees and rocks and landslips and then over all their feuds and bickerings came time at last as he always does and threw a veil over the conflict a veil of pine trees but in one respect both mountain and river seemed in perfect accord they would keep the land to themselves and their child the wild indian but the white man the child of civilization must be kept out nevertheless the white man came in and he named the rivers after his own names though they still laughed him to scorn and were useless to his commerce gradually this white fur hunter spread himself through the land he passed the fraser reached the columbia and gained its mouth and here a strange rival presented himself we must go back a little once upon a time a greek sailor was cast away on the shore where the northernmost mexican coast merged into unknown lands he remained for years a wanderer but when finally fate threw him again upon adriatic coasts he was the narrator of strange stories and the projector of far distant enterprises north of california shore there was he said a large island between this island and the mainland 
lay a gulf which led to those other gulfs which on the atlantic verge cartier and hudson had made known to europe in these days kings and viceroys gladly listened to a wanderer's story the greek was sent back to the coasts he had discovered commissioned to fortify the straits he called anion against english ships seeking through this outlet the northern passage to cathay over the rest time has drawn a cloud it is said that the greek sailor failed and died his story became a matter of doubt more than three hundred years passed away cook sought in vain for the strait and the gulf beyond it another english sailor was more fortunate and in seventeen fifty six a lonely ship passed between the island and the mainland and the long doubtful channel was named juan de fuca after the nickname of the forgotten greek to fortify the straits of anion was deemed the dream of an enthusiast yet by a strange coincidence we see today its realization and the island of san juan our latest loss has now upon its shores a hostile garrison bent upon closing the straits of Fuca against the ships of england north of california and south of british columbia there lies a vast region rich in forest prairie snow-clad peak alluvial meadow hill pasture and rolling tableland it has all that nature can give a nation its climate is that of england its peaks are as lofty as mont blanc its meadows as rich as the vales of somerset the spaniard knew it by repute and named it oregon after the river which we call the columbia oregon was at that time the entire west of the rocky mountains to the north of california oregon had long been a mystic land a realm of fable carver the indefatigable had striven to reach the great river of the west whose source lay near that of the mississippi the indians had told him that where the mississippi had its birth in the shining mountains another vast river also rose and flowed west into the shoreless sea carver failed to reach the shining mountains his dream remained to him probably he writes in future ages they the mountains may be found to contain more riches in their bowels than those of indostan or malabar or that are produced on the golden gulf of guinea nor will i accept even the peruvian mines today that dream comes true and from the caverns of the shining mountains men draw forth more gold and silver than all these golden realms enumerated by the baffled carver ever produced but the road which carver had pointed out was soon to be followed in the first years of the new century men penetrated the gorges of the shining mountain and reached the great river of the west but they hunted for furs and not for gold and fur hunters keep to themselves the knowledge of their discoveries before long the great republic born on the atlantic shores began to stretch its infant arms toward the dim pacific in seventeen ninety two a boston ship entered the mouth of the oregon river the charts carried by the vessel showed no river upon the coastline and the captain named the beaker tossed estuary after his ship the columbia he thought he had discovered a new river in reality he had but found again the older known oregon it is more than probable that this new named river would again have found its ancient designation had not an enterprising german now appeared upon the scene one jacob astor a vendor of small furs and hats in new york turned his eyes to the west he wished to plant upon the pacific the germs of american fur trade the story of his enterprise has been sketched by a cunning hand but under the brilliant coloring which a great artist has thrown around his tale of astoria the strong bias of the partisan is too plainly apparent yet it is easy to detect the imperfect argument by which washington irving endeavors to prove the right of the united states to the disputed territory of oregon the question is one of who was first upon the ground Irving claims that Astor, in 1810, was the first trader who erected a station on the banks of the Columbia. But in order to form his fort, Astor had to induce several of the employees of the Northwest Fur Company to desert their service. And Irving innocently tells us that when the overland expedition under Hunt reached the Columbia, 
they found the Indians well supplied with European articles, which they had obtained from white traders already domiciled west of the Rocky Mountains. He records the fact while he misses its meaning. British fur traders had reached Oregon long before Jacob Astor had planted his people on the estuary of the Columbia. Astor's factory had but a short life. The War of 1813 broke out, a British ship appeared off the bar of the Columbia River, and the Northwest Company, moving down the river, became the owners of Astoria. But, with their usual astuteness, the government of the United States claimed, at the conclusion of the war, the possession of Oregon, on the ground that it had been theirs prior to the struggle. That it had not been so is evident to any person who will carefully inquire into the history of the discovery of the northwest coast and the regions lying west of the mountains. But no one cares to ask about such things, and no one cared to do so even when the question was one of greater moment than it is at present. So, with the usual supineness which has left drift from us so many fair realms won by toil and daring of forgotten sons, we parted at last with this magnificent region of Oregon and signed it over to our voracious cousins. It was the old story so frequently repeated. The country was useless, a pine forest, a wilderness, a hopeless blank upon the face of nature. Today, Oregon is, to my mind, the fairest state in the American Union. There is a story widely told throughout British Columbia which aptly illustrates the past policy of Great Britain in relation to her vast wild lands. Stories widely told are not necessarily true ones, but this story has about it the ring of probability. It is said that once upon a time a certain British nobleman anchored his ship of war in the deep waters of Puget Sound. It was at a time when discussion was ripe upon the question of disputed ownership in Oregon, and this ship was sent out to the protection of British interests on the shores of the North Pacific. She bore an ill-fated name for British diplomacy. She was called the America. The commander of the America was fond of salmon fishing. The waters of the Oregon were said to be stocked with salmon. The fishing would be excellent. The mighty Echawan, monarch of the salmon, would fall victim to flies long famous on waters of Tweed or Tay. Alas for the perverseness of Pacific salmon. No cunningly twisted hackle, no deftly turned wing of mallard, summer duck, or jungle cock would tempt the blue and silver monsters of the Columbia or the Cowlitz rivers. In despair, his lordship reeled up his line, took to pieces his rod, and wrote in disgust to his brother, a prominent statesman of the day, that the whole country was a huge mistake that even the salmon in its waters was a fish of no principle, refusing to bite, to nibble, or to rise. In fine, that the territory of Oregon was not worthy of a second thought. So the story runs. If it be not true, it has its birth in that too true insularity which would be sublime if it did not cost us something like a kingdom every decade of years. Such has been the past of Oregon, it still retains a few associations of its former owners, from its massive forests, from its long-reaching rivers, and above its evergreen prairies, immense spire-shaped single peaks rise up 14,000 feet above the Pacific level. Far over the blue waters, they greet the sailor's eye, while yet the lower shore lies deep sunken beneath the ocean skyline. They are literally the shining mountains of Carver, and seamen say that at night, far out at sea, the Pacific waves glow brightly neath the reflected luster of their eternal snows. These solitary peaks bear English titles, and early fur hunters or sailor discoverer have written their now long forgotten names in snow white letters upon the blue skies of Oregon. But perhaps one of these days our cousins will change all that. Meantime, I have wandered far south from my lofty standpoint on the snowy ridges of the Bald Mountain in northern New Caledonia. Descending with rapid strides the mountain trail, we heard a faint signal call from the valley before us. It was from the party sent on the previous evening to await our arrival at the spot where Rufus had left his worn-out horses a week before. 
A few miles more brought us within sight of the blue smoke which promised breakfast, a welcome prospect after six hours forced marching over the steep ridges of the bald mountain. Two Indians, two miners, two thin horses, and one fat dog now formed the camp before the fire, at which we rested with feelings of keen delight. Tom, the carrier Indian, and Calder, my trusty henchman, had breakfast ready, and beans and bacon, to say nothing of jam and white bread, were still sufficient novelties to a winter traveler, long nourished upon the sole luxury of moose pemmican, to make eighteen miles of mountain exercise a needless prelude to a hearty breakfast. The meal over, we made preparations for our march to the south. In round numbers, I was three hundred miles from Quinell. Mountain, forest, swamp, river, and lake lay between me and that valley where the first vestige of civilized travel would greet me on the rapid waters of the Fraser River. Through all this land of wilderness, a narrow trail held its way. Now, under the shadow of lofty pine forest, now skirting the shores of lonely lakes, now climbing the mountain ranges of the Nation River, where yet the snow lay deep amid those valleys whose waters seek on one side the Pacific, upon the other the Arctic Ocean. Between me and the frontier city of Quinell lay the Hudson's Bay Fort of St. James, on the southeast shore of the lake called Stewart's. Here my companion Rufus counted on obtaining fresh horses. But until we could reach this halfway house, our own good legs must carry us, for the steeds now gathered into the camp were as poor and weak as the fast travel and long fasting of the previous journey could make them. They were literally but skin and bone, and it was still a matter of doubt whether they would be able to carry our small stock of food and blankets, in addition to their own bodies, over the long trail before us. Packing our goods on the backs of the skeleton steeds, we set out for the south. Before proceeding far, a third horse was captured. He proved to be in better condition than his comrades. A saddle was therefore placed on his back, and he was handed over to me by Rufus in order that we should ride and tie during the remainder of the day. In theory, this arrangement was admirable. In practice, it was painfully defective. The horse seemed to enter fully into the tying part of it, but the riding was altogether another matter. I think nothing but the direst starvation would have induced that cayuse to deviate in any way from his part of the tying. No amount of stick or whip or spur would make him a party to the riding. At last he rolled heavily against a prostrate tree, bruising me not a little by the performance. He appeared to have serious ideas of fancying himself tied when in this reclining position, and it was no easy matter to disentangle oneself from his ruins. After this, I dissolved partnership with Rufus, and found that walking was a much less fatiguing and less hazardous performance, if a little less exciting. We held our way through a wild land of hill and vale and swamp, some fifteen or sixteen miles, and camped on the edge of a little meadow where the old grass of the previous year promised the tired horses a scanty meal. It was but a poor pasturage, and next morning one horse proved so weak that we left him to his fate, and held on with two horses toward the Nation River. Between us and this Nation River lay a steep mountain, still deep in snow. We began its ascent while the morning was yet young. Since daylight it had snowed incessantly, and in a dense, driving snowstorm we made the passage of the mountain. The winter snow lay four feet deep upon the trail, and our horses sunk to their girths at every step. Slowly we plodded on, each horse stepping in the old footprints of the last journey, and pausing often to take a breath in the toilsome ascent. At length the summit was reached, but a thick cloud hung over peak and valley. Then the trail wound slowly downwards, and by noon we reached the shore of a dim lake, across whose bosom the snowstorm swept as though the time had been mid-November instead of the end of May. We passed the outlet of the Nation Lake, a sheet of water some thirty-five miles in length, lying nearly east-west, and held our way for some miles along its southern shore. In the evening we had reached a green meadow on the banks of a swollen stream. 
While Rufus and I were taking the packs off the tired horses, preparatory to making them swim the stream, a huge grizzly bear came out upon the opposite bank and looked at us for a moment. The Indians who were behind saw him approach us, but they were too far from us to make their voices audible. A tree crossed the stream, and the opposite bank rose steeply from the water to the level meadow above. Bruin was not twenty paces from us, but the bank hid him from our view, and when I became aware of his proximity, he had already made up his mind to retire. Grizzlies are seldom met under such favorable circumstances. A high bank in front, a level meadow beyond, I long regretted the chance, lost so unwittingly, and our cheerless bivouac that night in the driving sleet would have been but little heeded had my now rusty double barrel spoken its mind to our shaggy visitor. But one cannot always be in luck. All night long it rained and sleeted and snowed, and daylight broke upon a white landscape. We got away from camp at four o'clock and held on with rapid pace until ten. By this hour we had reached the summit of the tableland divide between the Arctic and Pacific Oceans. It is almost imperceptible, its only indication being the flow of water south instead of northeast. The day had cleared, but a violent storm swept the forest, crashing many a tall tree prostrate to the earth, and when we camped for dinner, it was no easy matter to select a spot safe from the dangers of falling pine trees. As I quitted this arctic watershed and stood on the height of land between the two oceans, memory could not help running back over the many scenes which had passed, since on that evening after leaving the long portage, I had first entered the river systems of the north. Full 1,300 miles away lay the camping place of that evening, and as the many long hours of varied travel rose up again before me, snow-swept, toil-laden, full at times of wreck and peril and disaster, it was not without reason that, turning away from the cold northern landscape, I saluted with joy the blue pine tops through which rolled the broad rivers of the Pacific. End of chapter 26「Twenty Seven of the Wild Northland」by William Francis Butler。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 We marched that day over thirty miles and halted in a valley of cottonwood trees amid green leaves again. We were yet distant about forty-five miles from Fort St. James, but my friend Rufus declared that a rapid march on the morrow would take us to the halfway house by sundown. Rapid marches had long since become familiar, and one, more or less, did not matter much. Daybreak found us in motion. It was a fast walk. It was a faster walk. It was a run, and ere the midday sun hung over the rich, undulating forest land, we were thirty miles from our camp in the cottonwood. Before noon, a lofty ridge rose before us. The trail wound up its long ascent. Rufus called it the Lookout Mountain. The top was bare of forest. The day was bright with sunshine. Not a cloud lay over the vast plateau of middle New Caledonia. Five hundred snowy peaks rose up along the horizon. The Nation Lake Mountains, the further ranges of the Aminica, the ridges which lie between the many tributaries of the Peace and the countless lakes of the North Fraser. Babine, Tatla, Pinkley, Stewart's, and far off to the west the old monarchs of the Rocky Mountains rose up to look a last farewell to the wanderer, who now carried away to distant lands a hundred memories of their lonely beauty. On the south slope of the Lookout Mountain, a gigantic pine tree first attracts the traveler's eye. Its seam trunk is dusky red, its dark and somber head is lifted high above all other trees, and the music which the winds make through its branches seems to come from a great distance. It is the Douglas pine of the Pacific coast, the monarch of the Columbian forests, a tree which Turner must have seen in his dreams. A few miles south of the mountain, the country opened out into pleasant prairies fringed with groves of cottonwood. The grass was growing thick and green, the meadows were bright with flowers. 
Three fat horses were feeding upon one of these meadows. They were the property of Rufus. We caught them with some little difficulty, and turned our two poor thin animals adrift in peace and plenty. Then, mounting the fresh steeds, Rufus and I hurried on to Fort St. James. The saddle was a pleasant change after the hard marching of the last few days. Mud and dust and stones, alternating with the snow of the mountains, had told heavily against our moccasin feet. But the worst was now over, and henceforth we would have horses to Quinell. It was yet some time before sundown when we cantered down the sloping trail which leads to the Fort St. James. Of course, the untiring was at his usual post, well to the front. Be it dog train, or march on foot, or march with horses, the untiring led the van, his tail like the plume of Henry of Navarre at Ivory, ever waving his followers to renewed exertions. It would be no easy matter for me to enumerate all the Hudson's Bay forts which the untiring had entered at the head of his train. Long and varied experience had made him familiar with every description of post, from the imposing array of wooden buildings which marked the residence of a chief factor, down to the little isolated hut, wherein some half-breed servant carries on his winter traffic on the shores of a nameless lake. Sir Fola knew them all. Freed from his harness in the square of a port, an event which he usually accelerated by dragging his sled and three other dogs to the doorway of the principal house, he at once made himself master of the situation, paying particular attention to two objective points. First, the intimidation of resonant dogs. Second, the topography of the provision store. Ten minutes after his entry into a previously unexplored fort, he knew to a nicety where the whitefish were kept and where the dry meat and pemmican lay. But on this occasion at Fort St. James, a woeful disaster awaited him. With the memory of many triumphal entries full upon him, he now led the way into the square of the fort, totally forgetting that he was no longer a hauling dog, but a freelance or a rover on his own account. In an instant, four huge haulers espied him, and charging from every side, ere I could force in upon the conflict to balance sides a little, they completely prostrated the hitherto invincible Eskimo, and at his last Hudson Bay post, near the close of his 2,500-mile march, he experienced his first defeat. We rescued him from his enemies before he had suffered much bodily hurt, but he looked considerably tail-fallen at this unlooked-for reception, and passed the remainder of the day in strict seclusion underneath my bed. Stewart's Lake is a very beautiful sheet of water. Tall mountains rise along its western and northern shores, and forest promontories stretch far into its deep blue waters. It is the favorite home of the salmon, when, late in summer, he has worked his long, toilsome way up the innumerable rapids of the Fraser, 500 miles from the Pacific. Colossal sturgeon are also found in its waters, sometimes weighing as much as 800 pounds. With the exception of rabbits, game is scarce along its shores, but at certain times rabbits are found in incredible numbers. The Indian women snare them by saxful, and everyone lives on rabbit, for when rabbits are numerous, salmon are scarce. The daily rations of a man in the wide domain of the Hudson's Bay Company are singularly varied. On the south shores of Hudson's Bay, a voyager receives every day one wild goose. In the Saskatchewan, he gets ten pounds of buffalo meat. In Athabasca, eight pounds of moose meat. In English River, three large white fish. In the north, half fish and reindeer. And here, in New Caledonia, he receives for his day's food eight rabbits or one salmon. Start not, reader, at that last item. The salmon is a dried one and does not weigh more than a pound and a half in its reduced form. After a day's delay at Fort St. James, we started again on our southern road. A canoe carried us to a point some five and twenty miles lower down the Stewart's River, a rapid stream of considerable size, which bears the outflow of the lake and of the long line of lakes lying north of Stewart's into the main Fraser River. 
I here said goodbye to Calder, who was to return to Peace River on the following day. A whiskey saloon in the neighborhood of the fort had proved too much for this hot-tempered half-breed, and he was in a state of hilarious grief when we parted. He had been very hasty, he said, and I would excuse him as he was sorry. He would always go with this master again if he ever came back to Peace River. And then the dog caught his eye, and overpowered by his feelings, he vanished into the saloon. Guided by an old carrier Indian chief, the canoe swept out of the beautiful lake and ran swiftly down the Stewart's River. By sundown, we had reached the spot where the trail crosses the stream, and here we camped for the night. Our horses had arrived before us under convoy of Tom the Indian. On the following morning, the 31st of May, we reached the banks of the Nacarol River, a large stream flowing from the west. Open prairies of rich land fringed the banks of this river, and as far as the eye could reach to the west, no mountain ridge barred the way to the western ocean. This river has its source within 20 miles of the Pacific, and is without doubt the true line of the sea for a northern railroad whenever Canada shall earnestly take in hand the work of ribboning together the now widely severed portions of her vast dominion. But to this subject I hope to have time to devote a special chapter in the appendix to this book, now that my long journey is drawing to a close, and these latter pages of its story are written amid stormy waves where a southward steering ship reels on beneath the shadow of Madeira's mountains. Crossing the wide Nacarol River and continuing south for a few miles, we reached a broadly cut trail which bore curious traces of past civilization. Old telegraph poles stood at intervals along the forest-cleared opening, and rusted wire hung in loose festoons down from their tops, or lay tangled amid the growing brushwood of the cleared space. A telegraph in the wilderness? What did it mean? When civilization once grasps the wild, lone spaces of the earth, it seldom releases its hold. Yet here, civilization had once advanced her footsteps, and apparently shrunk back again, frightened at her boldness. It was even so. This trail, with its ruined wire, told the wreck of a great enterprise. While yet the Atlantic cable was an unsettled question, a bold idea sprung to life in the brain of an American. It was to connect the old world and the new by a wire stretched through the vast forests of British Columbia and Alaska to the Straits of Bering, thence across the tundras of Kamchatka, and around the shores of Okhotsk the wires would run to the Amur River to meet a line which the Russian government would lay from Moscow to the Pacific. It was a grand scheme, but it lacked the elements of success because of ill-judged route and faulty execution. The great Telegraph Company of the United States entered warmly into the plan. Exploring parties were sent out, one pierced these silent forests, another surveyed the long line of the Yukon, another followed the wintry shores of the Sea of Okhotsk and passed the tundras of the Black Gulf of Anadir. Four millions of dollars were spent on these expeditions. Suddenly, news came that the Atlantic Cable was an accomplished fact. Brunel had died of a broken heart, but the New World and the Old had welded their thoughts together with the same blow that broke his heart. Europe spoke to America beneath the ocean, and the voice which men had sought to waft through the vast forests of the wild Northland and over the tundras of Siberia died away in utter desolation. So the great enterprise was abandoned, and today, from the lonely shores of Lake Babine to the bend of the Fraser at Quenelle, the ruined wire hangs loosely through the forest. During the first two days of June, we journeyed through a wild, undulating country, filled with lakes and rolling hills, grassy openings were numerous, and many small streams stocked with fish intersected the land. The lakes of this northern plateau are singularly beautiful. Many isles lie upon their surface. From the tiny promontories, the huge Douglas pine lifts his motionless head, the great northern diver, the loon, dips his white breast in the blue wavelets, 
and sounds his melancholy cry through the solitude. I do not think that I have ever listened to a sound which conveys a sense of indescribable loneliness so completely as this wail which the loon sends at night over the forest shores. The man who wrote, and on the mere the wailing died away, must have heard it in his dreams. We passed the noisy Indian village of Lake Nula and the silent Indian graves on the grassy shore of Lake Nulkai, and the evening of the 2nd of June found us camped in the green meadows of the West Road River, up which a white man first penetrated to the Pacific Ocean just 80 years ago. A stray Indian came along with news of a disaster. A canoe had upset near the Cottonwood Canyon of the Fraser, and the Hudson's Bay officer at Fort George had gone down beneath a pile of driftwood in the whirlpools of the treacherous river. The Indian had been with him, but he had reached the shore with difficulty and was now making his way to Fort St. James, carrying the news of the catastrophe. Forty more miles brought us to the summit of a ridge, from which a large river was seen flowing in the center of a deep valley far into the south. Beyond, on the further shore, a few scattered wooden houses stood grouped on a level bank. The wild rose trees were in blossom. It was summer in the forest, and the evening air was fragrant with the scent of flowers. I drew rein a moment on the ridge and looked wistfully back along the forest trail. Before me spread civilization and the waters of the Pacific. Behind me, vague and vast, lay a hundred memories of the wild Northland. For many reasons, it is fitting to end this story here. Between the ridge on the west shore of the Fraser and those scattered wooden houses on the east lies a gulf wider than a score of valleys. On one side, man. On the other, the wilderness. On one side, noise of steam and hammer, on the other, voice of wild things and the silence of the solitude. It is still many hundred miles ere I can hope to reach anything save a border civilization. The road which runs from Quesnel to Victoria is 400 miles in length. Washington Territory, Oregon, and California have yet to be traversed ere 1,500 miles from here the Golden Gate of San Francisco opens on the sunset of the Pacific Ocean. Many scenes of beauty lie in that long track hidden in the bosom of the Sierra. The Cascades, Rainier, Hood, and Shasta will throw their shadows across my path as the untiring dog and his now tired master wander south toward the grim Yosemite. But to link these things into the story of a winter journey across the yet untamed wilds of the Great North would be an impossible task. One evening I stood in a muddy street of New York. A crowd had gathered before the door of one of these immense buildings which our cousins rear along their city thoroughfares and call hotels. The door opened, and half a dozen dusky men came forth. Who are they? I asked. They are the Sioux chiefs from the Yellowstone, answered a bystander. They're a taking them to the theater to see Lester Wallach. Out on the great prairie, I had often seen the red man in his boundless home. Savage, if you will, but still a power in the land and fitting in every way the wilds in which he dwells. The names of Red Cloud and his brother chiefs from the Yellowstone were household words to me. It was the same Red Cloud who led his 500 whooping warriors on Fetterman's troops when not one soldier escaped to tell the story of the fight in the foothills of the Wyoming mountains. And here was Red Cloud, now in semi-civilized dress, but still a giant midst the puny rabble that thronged to see him come forth, with the gaslight falling on his dusky features and his eyes staring in bewildered vacancy at the crowd around him. Captain Jack was right. Better poor-hunted savage thy grave in the lava beds than this burlesque union of street and wilderness. But there was one denizen of the wilds who followed my footsteps into southern lands, and of him the reader might ask, what more? Well, the untiring took readily to civilization. He looked at Shasta, he sailed on the Columbia River, he climbed the dizzy ledges of the Yosemite, he gazed at the Golden Gate and saw the sun sink beyond the blue waves of the Great Salt Lake. 
but none of these scenes seemed to affect him in the slightest degree. He journeyed in the boot or on the roof of a stagecoach for more than 800 miles. He was weighed once as extra baggage and classified and charged as such. He conducted himself with all possible decorum in the rooms and corridors of the Grand Hotel in San Francisco. He crossed the continent in a railway carriage to Montreal and Boston as though he had been a first-class passenger since childhood. He thought no more of the reception room of Brigham Young in Utah than had he been standing on a snowdrift in Athabasca's Lake. He was duly photographed and petted and pampered, but he took it all as a matter of course. There were, however, two facts in civilization which caused him unutterable astonishment, a brass band and a butcher's stall. He fled from the one, he howled with delight before the other. I frequently endeavored to find out the cause of his aversion to music. Although he was popularly supposed to belong to the species of savage beast, music had anything but a soothing effect upon him. Whenever he heard a band, he fled to my hotel, and once, when they were burying a renowned general of volunteers in San Francisco with full military honors, he caused no small confusion amidst the mournful cortege by charging full tilt through the entire crowd. But the butcher's stall was something to be long remembered. Six or eight sheep and half as many fat oxen hung up by the heels apparently all for his benefit, was something that no dog could understand. Planting himself full before it, he howled hilariously for some moments, and when, with difficulty, I succeeded in conducting him to the seclusion of my room, he took advantage of my absence to remove, with the aid of his teeth, the obnoxious door panel which intervened between him and this paradise of mutton. On the Atlantic shore, I bid my old friend a long goodbye. It was night, and as the ship sailed away from the land, and I found myself separated for the first time during so many long months from a friend and servant and partner who, through every swift vicissitude of changeful time, unchanged had stood, I strung together these few rhymes, which were not the less true because they were only more doggerel. Old dog, goodbye, the parting time has come, hero on the verge of wild Atlantic foam. He who would follow when fast beats the drum must have no place of rest, no dog, no home. And yet I cannot leave thee even here where toil and cold and peace and rest shall end, poor faithful partner of a wild career through icy leagues, my sole unceasing friend. Without one word to mark our long goodbye, without a line to paint that wintry dream, when day by day, oh, husky thou and I, toiled o'er the great Unchaga's frozen stream. For now, when it is time to go, strange sights rise from the ocean of the vanished year, and wail of pines and sheen of northern lights flash o'er the sight and float on memory's ear. We cross again the lone, dim, shrouded lake where stunted cedars bend before the blast. Again, the camp is made amidst the break, the pine log's light upon thy face is cast. We talk together. Yes, we often spent an hour in converse while my bit thou shared. One eye, a friendly one, on me was bent, the other on some comrade fiercely glared. Deep slept the night, the owl had ceased his cry, unbroken stillness o'er the earth was shed. And crouched beside me, thou wert sure to lie, thy rest a-watching, snow thy only bed. The miles went on, the tens neath twenties lay, the scores to hundreds slowly, slowly rolled, and ere the winter wore itself away, the hundreds turned to thousands doubly told. But still thou wert the leader of the band, and still thy step went on through toil and pain, until, like giants in the wild Northland, a thousand glittering peaks frowned o'er the plain. And yet we did not part. Beside me still was seen thy bushy tail, thy well-known face. Through canyon dark and by the snow-clad hill thou kept unchanged thy old familiar pace. Why tell it all? Through fifty scenes we went, where Shasta's peak its lonely shadows cast, till now... 
for Afric shore my steps are bent, and thou and I, old friend, must part at last. Thou wilt not miss me, home and care are thine, and peace and rest will lull thee to the end. But still, perchance with low and wistful whine, thou'lt sometimes scan the landscape for thy friend. Or when the drowsy summer noon is high, or wintry moon upon the white snow shines, from dreamy sleep will rise a muffled cry for him who led thee through the land of pines. End of chapter 27 Read by Stephen Seidel Thank you for listening. End of the Wild Northland by William Francis Butler